this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchmen video broadcast. You know, it occurred to me, the very first time that Lucifer, the dragon, the devil, the serpent, uh, Satan, Belial, the adversary, <clears throat> it occurred to me the very first time he shows up in the Bible is right after God commanded man and gave his commandment and his word to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Now I'm going to read that to you. Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now God had already planted in the middle of the garden in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. He'd already planted what he called the tree of life. We know that after the, the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, that God didn't want Adam to have or be partaker of the tree of life uh, because of his sin. And so we know that before that, Adam had access to the tree of life. Now, I believe that the Bible is the tree of life to, let's say, the individual Christian, to the church or ministry or local congregation. I believe the Bible is the tree of life to a nation and the tree of life to the world. I believe that all who want to partake of the knowledge of God, the blessings of God, and the sustenance of God may freely eat. Jesus said, whosoever will may come unto me. Come unto him freely, the Bible says. No, no church, no religious institution can bar anyone or should bar anyone from approaching the tree of life and eating. And so God says, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. And I like to think of uh, the book of Job as one of the trees of the garden. I like to think of the book of Ezekiel as one of the trees of the garden. The gospel of John as one of the trees of the garden that mankind may freely eat from and live forever. But then he says... But of the tree, in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 2, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So here we have two trees in the midst of the garden. We have the tree of life, and God said, eat freely. You can eat all you want to, and you'll live. And God says, now, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which was, according to the Bible, was right next to it. And God said, don't eat of that tree, for in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now that was the commandment that God gave to Adam in the Garden of Eden, the law as it were. God laid down the law and said, Adam, you have to do what I say. Now interestingly enough, in, in my King James Bible, as I count <clears throat> from verse 16 to verse 17, the number of words that God spoke to Adam in the Garden of Eden with this commandment, 39 words here. That's that's how many books are in the Old Testament of the Bible. I just, I just think that's interesting here. So then, then God creates uh, the woman, brings her to, to the man, and uh, all they're going to live happily, right? Then the devil shows up. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the deceiver, the Bible calls him. He shows up, and the first thing that he does... He doesn't talk about the weather, doesn't talk about politics, he doesn't talk about uh, Eve and her hair that she had that day. He doesn't talk about anything like that. The first thing he does is to attack and contradict and offer a replacement for the word, the commandments that God gave to Adam. So Genesis chapter 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, big question mark here, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Big question mark. Yet did, did God really say that? And I want you to think about this. Because Paul warned us that in the last days, in the days that we're living in right now, there would be some who would come just like the serpent and his subtlety. Paul told us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. In other words, how he works, how he does things. And this is how he works. He begins to question the word of God. And then he contradicts the word of God by saying, God said, you shall surely die. The devil, the serpent said, oh no, ye shall not surely die. A direct contradiction to the word of God. And then, <clears throat> here we go here. Then he offers Eve a replacement. In other words, uh, here, is the, here is the word of God, and it's the tree of life. If you eat this, you'll live. 
Okay? And the devil, the devil hates this book. He hates everything this book represents. He hates the Savior that's behind this book, Jesus Christ. He wants to try to get this book to be wrong somehow, to be in error some way. He wants to question it. He wants to contradict it. And he wants to replace it with something else. That's going to be the thing. I have here, stacked up here. You usually see a stack of books sitting here. Uh, I still have them here. Here's Morals and Dogma and everything else. But I have an, another stack of books here we're going to be <clears throat> showing you because in contained in all of these are exactly the devil's plan to, number one, question the Bible, number two, contradict the Bible, and number three, replace the Bible. Let me show you some other scriptures on, on that will give us some light on not only what the devil is doing, but how he's doing it. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. This is the parable of the seed and the sower. And I love the Bible because if you'll let the Bible do its job, the Bible will explain the Bible. The Bible will explain the Bible better than I or Dr. So-and-so from Theological Seminary or over here. The, the Bible will explain the Bible better than any man in the world. And so Mark chapter 4 is one of those examples. The Bible says, And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now, we know in Mark chapter 4 that Jesus is referring to the seed. The Bible says the seed is the word of God. And you can think of it this way. Here God planted, God planted a garden. Where did he put man? When he created man, where, where did he put him in the midst of the garden? You see, God sowed seed into the earth, and that, and that seed was Adam. A Adam was carrying the spoken word of God in his DNA. Okay, so I want you to think about that for a minute. So here God sowed the word. When the preacher preaches out of the pure word of God, the, the word of God is sowed in, a, in the men's hearts. And so Jesus said, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now, the Bible will explain to you what the seed is and who these fowls of the air. Remember, fowls of the air, they're, they're creatures that have wings. I want you to think about this, okay? Creatures that have wings. Angels, cherubs, have wings. Mark chapter 4, verse 15. And these are they which, by the wayside, where the word is sown, but when they have heard... Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now I want you to think about this. Think about uh, the beauty of the Bible here. Here, here a, a doctrine is given. And we go back to what God says. He declares the end from the beginning. We go back to the beginning. And here we have the word sown in Adam in his DNA. And here we have <coughs> Satan coming immediately. To take away the word, the commandment that God gave to him. Eat of, eat of all the trees freely except this one. Satan comes immediately and he takes away the word. I want you to start thinking now as we go through this. And I'm going to show you examples. I want you to start thinking of, number one, how the devil might take away the word out of your life. Or let's say out of your church. Out of the denomination that you belong to, out of the ministry that you follow, how the devil might take the word, how the devil has taken the Bible out of our country. Our country was founded upon the Bible. How did the devil succeed in eliminating prayer, Bible reading in public schools and in public places, taking the Ten Commandments out of courtrooms? How, how did he do that? Okay, His method of operation always remains the same. You must doubt it, contradict it, and replace it with something else. And so I want you to start thinking along those lines because that is exactly how he comes. He comes down immediately and takes away the word that was sown in people's hearts. And you, you know as well as I do, you throw seed on the ground, if a bird comes down and scoops it up, that seed is not going to bear 
any fruit. And in this case, it's the fruit of righteousness, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, uh, the nine fruits of the Spirit given to us in the book of Galatians, and so on. So it's all about salvation. The devil, he hates the Bible because it gives people eternal life. He hates the Bible because it saves mankind, and he can't handle that. So he is going to try whatever he can to take it away. And if he can't come immediately and take it away from somebody, then he's always got plan B okay, and plan C. Later on, in Mark chapter 4, verse 7, we find out that some of the seed didn't fall by the wayside. The devil didn't come pick it up. But don't worry, the devil's got another plan. Notice what happens. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Then he explains what this is in Mark chapter 4, verse 18. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And now we have three things here. Number one, the cares of this world. Number two, the deceitfulness of riches. I want you to pay attention to that. And number three, the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Now I want you to get this, okay? The devil does not want you to produce the fruit. Jesus said, I'm the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, the same bringeth forth much fruit. He does not want you to abide in Christ, hence the word of God. And he does not want you to produce fruit or bear fruit. He does not want that. And so his job is to come in, either take away the word completely, or get thorns to choke out the word so that it becomes totally unfruitful. That's his job. Matthew chapter 13, the Bible says, But while men slept, this is the parable of the wheat and the tares. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And so we know, watch this now. We know that the devil, number one, he's going to try to come in and take it away. Number two, he's going to try to choke it out so that it never bears fruit. Or, or, he's going to try to, to mingle it with other things. Now I want you to think about how he works. And it's all in an effort to keep this Bible from doing what God said it was going to do in the heart of a believer. Let me give you another illustration of this and how it works in the spirit that's behind it. Judges chapter 16, we have the story of Samson and Delilah. Boy, Delilah must have been a real sweetie. And Samson, if you study the life of Samson, you understand that Samson just, uh, he had a thing for the ladies, okay? That was, I mean, Samson was strong in every way. Could beat the Philistines. But he couldn't turn down a woman. And I want you to think about that. Because the adverse spirit that's described in the Bible that is opposite of the Holy Spirit is described as mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Always characterized as a woman or a female that is in total opposition to the Word of God. I want you to think about Jezebel. Jezebel did not care or appreciate the Word of God and the law and the commandments concerning Naboth's vineyard. We're going to talk about that in a little bit too. But here is Mystery Babylon the Great showing up as Delilah, attacking Samson in his weakness. And what was it? You see, Delilah... Think about it. The love of money is the root of all evil. Delilah was paid off. Remember earlier, we talked about how the word can get choked out by thorns. And one of them was the deceitfulness of riches. The love of money. If you love money more than you love the word of God, that thorn is going to grow and it's going to choke out the word in your life, in your church's life, your denomination. We are seeing denominations and churches right now that are selling out to false gospels and false doctrines. Why? Because there's more money in it. That's what's going on, people. And you see it in, in individual pe- uh, persons. You see it in churches. You see it in denominations. You see it in ministries. Guys that 20, 30 years ago used to preach this Bible and preach it hot and preach it hard. 
All of a sudden, all of a sudden money made them change their mind. And here's Delilah. And does Delilah do what she's doing here with Samson just because she doesn't like Samson? No. Delilah is uh, basically, you know, what every other harlot is. She's well paid. The Philistines went to Delilah and said, you know, each of us, five lords here, each of us are going to give you 1,100 pieces of silver or gold or whatever it was. We're going to pay you well. If you'll just find out, listen to this now, if you'll just find out the secret of Samson's power, his strength, his might. I will tell you, it's no secret to those who believe the scriptures, and I'll show you this in a minute. It's no secret to us who believe the Bible that the source of our power against the devil, against sin, against death itself, is not in of, of ourselves. It is in the word of God. And so I want you to notice this parable. She finally, she finally gets Samson to, to lay down in her lap. Judges verse 16, verse 19. Notice, she made him sleep upon her knees. She did this. She caused a deep sleep to come upon him. And she called for a man and caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him. And his strength went from him. Here's the symbolism behind the seven locks. The seven locks represent, the number seven represents in the Bible, represents several things. Let's look at them very quickly. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. Let me go to um, Isaiah chapter 11. Anytime I mention the seven spirits of God, I always like to show you what they are in the scriptures. Isaiah chapter 11. This is a, a promise concerning the Lord Jesus Christ because the Bible says that he has the seven spirits of God. And so in Isaiah chapter 11, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That branch, that, that, uh, that rod is Jesus Christ who came from the lineage of Jesse through King David. And then verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's one. And the spirit of wisdom. That's two. And understanding, that's three. The spirit of counsel, that's four. And might, that's number five. The spirit of knowledge, that's six. And the fear of the Lord, that's seven. Here are the seven spirits of God, not only are talked about in the scriptures, but they're identified that Jesus had the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit of God in him. He was full of the Spirit. And so here Samson is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, let, me, let me just kind of break off for a minute. I love this. Samson is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in that his, his enemies reigned over him, but he destroyed his enemies in his death. Think about Christ at Calvary. Boy, the devil really thought he was getting old Jesus, didn't he? Ah, we got him hanging on a cross. The devil didn't realize. The devil didn't know. He couldn't know because he's so full of pride. The devil couldn't realize that what he was doing by having Christ crucified, Christ was taking the power of Satan to the grave with him. Okay, He was defeating death by his own death. And so here Jesus has the seven spirits of God. Samson has the power of God represented by the seven locks of his hair. What did Delilah do? Okay, Did she tie him up in pretty bows and say, see, isn't that pretty? No. She called for a man. And he came in. Began to shave off the seven locks of his hair. When Samson awoke, he, he didn't know his power was gone from him. But he was as weak and his enemies prevailed over him. Why? Because the power of God, the written word of God, the Bible, was taken out of his life. Listen to this verse. Psalm chapter 12 verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Remember, the Bible purified, the words of the Lord purified seven times. God has a book in his right hand and it's sealed. Guess how many times? Seven seals. It represents the seal of the Holy Spirit of God. That seals, those seals on that book represent, number one, God's authority, God's approval, God's holding power. Nothing, nothing can change what's in this book. It's unalterable. It, it is, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it is incorruptible. No man 
because it's sealed by the Holy Spirit. No man can corrupt the true Word of God. No man can. And so here we have Samson. He has the seven locks of his hair that represents the power of the seven times purified Word of God in his life. And Delilah came in, took away his Bible. Okay, Just like Satan coming in, stealing the Word, choking it out, getting you to replace it somehow, some way, that's, or mingling it with other things. Here is Delilah, and she brings a man in, and he cuts off the Word of God out of Samson's life. And now there is nothing any more special about him than anybody else. He has been brought back down to weakness. Notice Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is... Is here it is. It is the power of God. Paul didn't say that it. Well, you know, it's one of those things that will help us. And and here's a bunch of other things. You've noticed my collection of books here. Okay, I have. I, this is a collection of things that are meant to be a replacement for or a mingling to the real Word of God. Okay? Notice that Paul didn't say, well, you know, the gospel is, is one of many things that I think can help us because, after all, we know that many roads lead to the same God. Paul never said that. Paul never said that. He said, I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed. I don't care how many, and Paul didn't say this, but I don't care how many Muslims there are praying in the streets. I don't care how many Buddhists there are. I don't care how many uh, false doctrines there are. I will not be ashamed. The gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Let me, let me show you what this means. I, I just love the, just the layout of the Bible. Okay? Uh, he says that, number one, the word of truth is the power of God. And he says it's the, it's the, uh, the shield, uh, the armor of righteousness. And he says it's on, the, uh, it's on the right hand and on the left. Here is on the right hand, here is the New Testament. Here on the left is the Old Testament. And both of them become the shield and the armor of righteousness. But all of it together, all 66 books together, represent the word of truth and the power of God. And I want you to think about it now because when you take away the power of God, let's say out of a Christian's life, out of a church, out of a denomination or a ministry, out of a country, it's got to be replaced with something. It's got to be, it's got to be something in its place. And we're going to see what it is that replaces the Bible in all of these instances here. Matthew chapter 22 verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. You see, God connected it right here. That the power of God, it's not in me. It's not in, it's not in the, the exalted evangelist. It's not in the PH, PhD scholars who've come from the seminaries. It's, it's, not, it's not in them. The power of God in an individual Christian or church or ministry's life is the Word of God. We live in a time right now where the Word of God, the devil came and he took away the Word. And in churches all across this country, in individual lives all across this land, denominations, ministries, groups, Bible colleges, the real, powerful, inerrant Word of God doesn't exist anymore. The devil came and he took it away. So well, stop thinking about it. If, there's, if it's a seminary and they're not studying the pure, inerrant Word of God, what do they just show up and... And play games all day in college and get a degree for... No, 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 no. They're, they're learning about the replacement that comes in. And I'll show you what that is. Uh, so he says, You do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Luke 22, verse 69. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Remember? The right hand of the power of God. What's in the right hand of God? The seven-sealed book. 
that is the authority and the power of God. It is the word of God purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them. That's what a seal is for. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God said the word of God would never, ever decay. It would never be defiled. Not the pure, true word of God. It never would. And so it represents the power of God. And just think of Delilah. Comes in with her scissors. Brings it, hey, bring your scissors here. The guy comes in and cuts off the power of God in Samson's life. Now, he has no power to stand against his enemy. And see, the enemies, think about it now. Think about, let, let, let's, say that, uh, let's say that you're a nation and you're trying to defeat your enemies. And they have a super weapon. They have a, they have a super, sort of like, a, like Iran. Iran's building nuclear bombs right now. I mean, everybody in the whole world knows knows it. And they're building super weapons. Right? And you know what the CIA did? The CIA said, you know what? We can't have Iran building nuclear bombs. So you know what they did? They attacked them. They sent a virus that was written specifically to target the Iranian nuclear facilities, their computers. And it worked for a while. Shut them down for, I don't know, eight months or something like that. And now we're hearing that there's explosions and things going on in Iran that seem to be targeting their nuclear weapons capability. You see, if you're going to go after the enemy, you have to attack him where he's, where he's strong at. If he has a super weapon, you've got to get that super weapon away from him. And I'm here to tell you that as a Christian, as a born-again Christian, you have a super weapon to use against your enemy. You say, well, what is that, Pastor Mike? It's the same one that Jesus used. Remember when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was fasting for 40 days and Satan came to him, went to him personally to attack him, tempted him three times. He went after the word of God. How did Jesus defeat him? He quoted scripture. That's all he did. And he didn't go like that and make some sign and or magic symbol or you know a, a, he didn't do anything like that he didn't punch him didn't choke hold him he just quoted scripture and he left him he couldn't the devil couldn't handle the word of god that's the power that this bible has okay but it's been replaced and I want you to I want you to understand something. I I am a I'm a human being. I, I'm just a mortal human being made out of dirt, just like every dirt bag in the whole planet. I don't have any special power in anything that I say or my ability to speak or anything like that. I'm just gonna give you what the scripture says because man, man doesn't have the authority that God has. And where is God's authority? Where is His power? What is the scepter of God? It's in His right hand. It's a book sealed with seven seals. Listen to Romans chapter 3 verse 4. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Man doesn't have any authority other than what God gives him. God is the highest and final authority in everything. And the book, the power of God that he has in his right hand, represents his authority, his power, his dominance, the fact that there is nothing. You see, they called God in the Bible, they called him most high. You know what that means? means there's not something most or high than God that who is the most high. There's nothing higher in authority than God and the book that he has in his right hand. I'm going to give you some examples of how man's authority has overridden and contradicted God's authority through the scriptures. You see here a picture of the Pope. He believe the Pope now, the Pope believes and every Roman Catholic, if you're one of the one billion Roman Catholics in this world, you believe this, or you're told to believe this, okay? You're told to believe that the Pope is the highest authority 
even over the Bible. Now, let's go back to that verse. Let God be true. And how many men are to be a liar? Every man. The Pope, he's a man. And even though the, uh, the, the College of Cardinals had a little sacred ritual over him and poured incense all over him and sprinkled him with holy water and said Latin words over him, saying that now you're the vicar of Christ. You are Christ on this earth. That, that doesn't really change anything. Doesn't really mean anything. The Pope is still just a man. And if the Pope says one thing, and the Bible says something completely different, you have to decide who you're going to believe. You see, the power of God does not exist in the Roman Catholic system because their system is not based upon the Word of God. In fact, it's based upon a hatred for the Word of God. If the Pope says, well, I think we ought to all pray to Mary, then that's what one billion Roman Catholics all over the world must do to inherit what the Catholic Church calls eternal life. Okay? So here is a quote. Let me tell you how this works. Let me tell you the Vatican view of the Scriptures. This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia. It came out somewhere around 1902. The belief in the Bible as the sole source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. Now, I, I've spent some time here just trying to tell you and trying to convince you from the Bible that there is no other authority on this earth that's higher than the written Word of God. No other authority higher than the written Word of God. It is the power of God. Two men on this earth, the Scriptures that we have. The Catholic Church comes along and says the belief in the Bible as the sole source of faith is, number one, unhistorical. You know what they're trying to say? Nobody really believed that. Oh, come on. You, you, you people that believe that, you're something cuckoo about you because nobody believed it. Well, listen, let me tell you something, okay? Just because one billion people don't believe it and five do, that doesn't mean that the one billion people are right. You see, truth is not necessarily designed for the masses. Truth is, truth is not necessarily accommodating to the majority. Truth is truth. And the Bible says, few there be that find it. And so just because, you know, 2,000 years of Roman Catholicism has said, well, we don't really believe the Bible, that doesn't mean anything. Number two, he says it's illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. And I'm going to stop right here. Because what they're saying, remember this is written by men, directly contradicts the Word of God. They say that it's fatal to the virtue of faith. However, the written Word of God says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by, what, the Pope? No, the Word of God. It's totally contradicting to what this Bible says. Here is, in 1963, uh, all the Vatican cardinals, the Jesuits, the monks, they all got together and they said, you know, we're going we're gonna to try to bring everybody in the world under our little happy umbrella so that everybody in the world follows the same mystery cult that we do. It's called the Second Vatican Council. The result of that, 1964, was called the Roman Pontifical Biblical Commission. See, that just sound, it sounds spiritual, doesn't it? The Roman Pontifical Biblical Commission. It sounds like that they're going to, all these learned priests are going to get together and say, the Bible is a sacred, sacred book. That's not really what they said. They launched out against a fundamental idea. Now, I have a fundamental idea. And that fundamental is foundational in my life. That the Bible alone is the Word of God. That's the fundamental idea of my mind. So that makes me a fundamentalist. Okay? And every now and then I like to put fun in fundamentalism. Okay, And every now and then I like to be mental about fundamentalism. Anyway, here is what the Roman Pontifical Biblical Commission said concerning a belief that the Bible is the only Word of God. Here is what the esteemed bishops said. The fundamentalist approach is dangerous. Let, let me stop right here. The only, the only people in the world that the fundamentalist approach is dangerous to is these guys. 
Okay, it's dangerous to them because they can't come in and overpower people if this Bible is already empowering them. So it is dangerous. The fundamentalist approach is dangerous for it is attractive to people who look to the Bible for ready answers to the problems of life. It can deceive these people, offering them interpretations that are pious but illusory. That means they're not real. Instead of telling them that the Bible does not contain an immediate answer to each and every problem. Without saying as much in so many words, fundamentalism actually invites people to a kind of intellectual suicide. Stop right here. They're saying that if you believe the Bible is the Word of God and it's the sole source of faith and practice and belief and everything and that it has the answers to life, if you believe that, you're an idiot. Intellectual suicide, they call it. You're just, you're just killing yourself. You'll, you'll ne- you'll, it's kind of like what Satan said. If you don't eat of this tree, you'll never become the gods like I am. They go on to say it injects into life fundamentalism, the idea that the Bible's Word of God injects into life a false certitude, for it unwittingly confuses the divine substance of the biblical message with what are, in fact, its human limitations. Ah, ah, see, I'm getting angry. The Pope, the bishops, the cardinals, the, the holy men. Okay, who are really after money and you know what. Okay, uh, these, these men say the Bible is so limited. Oh, these, these ignorant and unlearned men that wrote this Bible. It's not really the Word of God. However, when we put a crown on a Pope, okay, and he sits there in this multi-billion trillion dollar palace that we built in the Vatican. When he sits there, he's God. And whatever he says is God. Remember that? Now, you have to decide if you're going to believe this. Because God said, the Bible said, let God be true and every man a liar. So what are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the Bible? Or are you going to believe what these men, who we know are corrupt, are we going to believe the Bible or are we going to believe these men? So here it is. Here is, here is Satan right here. Okay, right with a little fish God had on was what the Pope wears. Here is Satan right here immediately coming in to those poor Roman Catholic people who many of them just want to believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ. And here is the Roman pontificate, the, the, the Vatican, the, the powers that be. Here are those people representing Satan coming in saying... Don't believe the Bible. If American missionaries bring you the Bible, don't read it. Bring, you bring it to us, we'll dispose of it properly. They're trying to take away the word out of billions of people's minds and hearts all over the world. That's Satan right there. We have two young men in our church, uh, Brady and Bradley. And they came to me several years ago. Twin brothers. You see them preach every Sunday night here. They, uh, Brady used to be a uh, Jehovah's Witness. Okay, Jehovah's Witness. And I would, spend, I would spend long times on the phone with Brady trying to convince him that Jesus was in fact God. And he wouldn't believe it. And he wouldn't believe it because the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society... Um, the Watchtower Bible Attract Society decided that the Bible was, oh, it was so terribly, oh, it was, oh, it's all messed up. Oh, my goodness. The terrible things that the Bible has done. So the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society came in and they, um, well, they rewrote it. Okay? Remember, the, the devil is either going to take it away. Is going to replace it with something. So they come in and rewrote it. It's called the New World Translation. And I'd be reading in the King James something that just proved the divinity of Jesus Christ. And I'd call Brady on the phone. Hey, Brady, got one for you. And I'd read in the King James and he would open up his New World Translation and go, Nah, that's not what the, it's not what the New World Translation says. Whew. This guy got saved. 
Not by Mike Hoggard, not by Bethel Church. He got saved by the Word of God. And he walked away and rejected everything that they stood for. Because they come in, watch this now, they come in not only with their replacement Bible, but they come in with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. All the magazines, all the literature, all the books that they write and own to, to twist the gospel into something that it was never intended to be. Bradley was a Mormon, a dyed in the wool Mormon. The Mormon church. I have, watch it, I have, I have right up here, here's here's my books here. I have uh, two books have been in my possession for years. This one is the Book of Mormon, and this one is Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. Now, if you don't know what these books are, this is, here we go, watch this, okay? Um, this is the another testament of Jesus Christ. Now, Bradley is quick to point out, in fact, we have a video done by Bradley. He compares uh, the Book of Mormon with the King James Bible, does an excellent job on it. But he said right on the front cover, you know, Paul warned us, if, if we are an angel from heaven, who was Moroni? We, though an angel of heaven, bring you any other gospel, let him be cursed. And it says right here, another testament of Jesus Christ. You know what it is? It's another gospel. Okay? And so this was written by Joseph Smith. Now let me tell you the little story. The angel Moroni said, now Joseph, dig down in the ground. There's some golden plates down there written, written in some made up language called uh, re reformed uh, hieroglyphics or something like that. And Joseph Smith put on these special glasses called the Urim and Thummim. I think I'm getting this right. And he was able to decipher all of these ancient uh, hieroglyphs of this you know, this Egyptian language that nobody has ever heard of before. Okay? And here's here's what's funny. The King the, the, the Mormons will use two primary books. They'll use the King James Bible and they'll use the Book of Mormon. Now here's what's funny to me. Fifty four men in a circular fashion translated the King James Bible. It is without a doubt, even if you don't believe the Bible, the King James Bible has had the most influence of any one thing in the last four hundred years of human history. No doubt about it whatsoever. Everybody says that, okay? Fifty four men in a circular fashion translating the King James Bible, and it is right. The Mormon doctrine as contained in the Doctrine and Covenants Pearl Great Price, says that we, we believe the King James Bible in as much as it's translated correctly. We don't think it is. However, Joseph Smith, by himself, from a book that nobody has ever seen, from a language that nobody has ever heard of, by himself, translated every word of the Book of Mormon absolutely 100% perfectly. And you're supposed to believe that. Okay? So remember... The devil, if he can't take away the Bible, he'll add to it. So that when you go to the Mormon church, you might hear a little King James scripture every now and then. But they're going to say, now turn to the book of Alma, chapter 17. Or turn over here to 3rd Nephi. Uh, go over here, and on and on and on. And then they'll say here, the doctrine, the pearl of great price. These are the doctrines that were laid out by Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and others. Okay? And they'll say, see, right in here is our final authority. Whatever, see, Joseph Smith was a prophet. Did you know that? And God spoke to him things that were not in the King James Bible. Okay? Remember, going to add to it. And then, you have, and then you have on top of that, you have the quorum of the twelve. These twelve good-looking men in suits and ties that sit at the top of the Mormon church and, and a prophet who oversees them and whatever, whatever they come up with, oh, that's gospel. You see, when Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were doing it, they were saying, oh yeah, find these 13-year-old girls and marry a bunch of them. Okay? It's called polygamy, and God want, God told me that he wants us to have multiple li wives, and they all got to be pretty young, you know, to go along with it. And uh, it just kind of sounds fishy to me. Uh, but anyway, that's what Joseph Smith, God told him. Okay? And then when the United States Congress outlawed polygamy and said, you're going to go to jail for a long time if you do this, all of a sudden now the apostle in the Quorum of the Twelve said, God's telling us that really polygamy is not a good thing. See, and you're so, and, and 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 we have a guy. We have a guy as a Mormon who's running for president of the United States, and he follows this. You see what happens? That the power of God, if it's not taken away, 
It's mingled with other things. And you're not supposed to do that. The devil has taken away the power of God. Now I'm going to get something. You say, well, that's the cults. Yeah, I'm not in a cult. I go to such and such church. Let me tell you how else it's happening. Christian book publishers. Christian book publishers. Let me read you a verse of scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now I'm going to stop right here. This is in reference to the coming of the Antichrist. And Paul is warning Christians, don't let anybody deceive you by any means. Christian book distributing companies, bookstores all over the country. Even in other... I've been in Kenya and I went into a Christian bookstore there and it was loaded with false doctrines of every kind. Replacements for the Word of God. People say, well, you know, I don't really understand the Bible, but I read Purpose Driven Life, and boy, I got a lot out of that. Let me tell you something. The power that you're seeking for in your life will never, ever, in a million years, come from Rick Warren and 40 Days of Purpose, this or that or the other. It won't happen. You're try- you, have- you have let the devil talk you into that there is a valid replacement for daily Bible reading and study in your life. You've let the devil talk you. Oh no, I use these books as an as an addition to the Word of God. See how it works? See how it works. Let no man deceive you by any means. The devil comes in to the Christian... Think about it. If you were the devil, and at one time... Now, at one time, there were some good books being written by some good godly men that were based solely upon Scripture. It's not that way anymore. The devil decided, you know what, i gotta get to, I got to get to these big guys at the publishing houses. And so he's gotten to Zondervan, and he's gotten to other companies that publish these books. And he's working from the top down. He's getting people to write. Roger Oakland, in his book, Faith Undone, does an excellent job of exposing how this works. He's talking about these emergent church leaders and how, how they were allowed to come in. Jude said certain men crept in unawares. And you have have these guys that have crept in and how did they do it they were commissioned by these book publishers to write books to get them into the hands of church members and pastors all over the country to draw them away from the pure doctrines where the power of God is to draw them away from the pure doctrines of the scriptures into seducing spirits and doctrines of devils that's how it's happened and then then it dawned on me a long time ago um, That maybe, if the devil really wanted to do a good job, maybe he should get into the seminaries and the Bible colleges. You see, at one time, he had these colleges that were set up all over the place, and all the, all they had now was just a King James Bible, and they said, now, uh, here's, you know, Zechariah is about this, and Ezekiel is about this, and the Gospels were about this, and study this, and write reports on this, and, and, and go preach. That's what they used to do. But now, the, the seminaries, okay, and, and a, lot of, a, lot, I, you know, a lot of the research that I do on some of these latter-day false prophets, you know where a lot of them showed up from? They showed up from Fuller Theological Seminary and others that are cranking out these. Here, here it is, you have a church, you have a local congregation where an old preacher is preaching an old Bible in there and he's sowing the word. And so the Bible colleges send out these new young guys that have been trained differently and taught differently and they've read a lot of other books other than the scriptures and gotten their ideas on theology and salvation and Bibleology. They've gotten their ideas not from the word of God but from old Dr. So-and-so or, or this book over here. And then we turn these guys loose into the churches and they stand in front of the pulpits And they take away the word of God from these people. I've read, don't try to to say that I don't know what I'm talking about. I've read the preacher threads on on little preacher chat lines. One of the the biggest items of discussion is when you go to a new church, how do you get the King James Bible out of that congregation? Can you believe that? Can you believe that men who were who come out of Bible colleges, who are supposedly called to preach by God, go to a new church, and they need to figure out how in the world they can get the King James Bible out of that congregation and replace it with new translations? I'm not making this up. Okay? 
Satan will come and he will take away the word of God. And so here's how they do it. Let me get to, so number one, step number one, get people out of the King James Bible. So how do we do it? Uh, I'm reading from the New King James Bible. All it does is it just, you know, doesn't say thee and thou. That's not all it does. They're lying to you. Then they'll send these guys in. And I have a book here called the Greek New Testament. Here's a, here's a picture of what it looks like. Now, I was uh, moderately well trained. I went to Bible college. Okay, I can read some of these words that are on this page. Kai eporuthesein ekestos aistan oikon atu. Okay, this is ekata yohanin. Okay, this is according to according to John, the Gospel of John, in the original Greek. The problem is, um, I, I don't I don't know what that says, and you don't either. You don't have a clue what it says. How, how do you know what this says? You don't know. And so they send these guys down with Hebrew and with Greek languages, letters that you can't even read. And they send these guys down in there and say, now, you give them a lot of Greek. You give them the original manual. You give them original Greek. And here's what you do. You, most of these people in your church now are going to have a King James Bible, and they've been reading that for years. But here's what happens. The young pre- And see, I know this because I did it. I did exactly what I was encouraged to do. I went into a church and I said, now the original Greek says this and the original Greek says that. You know why why I wanted to do that? I wanted those church people to know that I was smarter than they were. They were just a bunch of old farmers and and, uh, workers and this and that. I was Bible college trained. I wanted them to think that I was smarter than they were. So I was original Greek this and original Greek that. And they all had their Bibles and they were going... Well, it says right here, and I'd say, no, no, in the the original languages, here's what it really says. You know what I just did? I just took away the word out of their life and out of their heart. I took it away. I replaced it with something, but it's something, they don't have a clue what this is. They don't have a clue what this says. Okay? So that's that's how it's done. You say, well, well... It's the original languages, yeah. Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. I know all about that. Can I tell you, can I show you, remember, God be true and every man a liar. Okay? Can can I show you from the Word of God what it says here about how people are supposed to hear the gospel? Acts chapter 2 verse 7. At the very beginning of the church, I mean right off the bat, before God does anything else, Here's what God does with the Christian church. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our tongue wherein we were born? You see, you know what they were doing? They were speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What were they doing? They were speaking in not just Hebrew and not just Greek. They were speaking in the languages that these people were born into. Languages that they knew very, very well. You see, you might study a little Greek. You might even get you a little concordance and and, uh, look up words every now and then. So, well, I guess that's what it means. How do you know the concordance is telling the truth? And these guys come out of Bible colleges and seminaries and give people all the... And they say, well, now in your, in your Bible it says this. But let, let me tell you what the real... Let me tell you what the real Word of God says. And in that person's mind, they're either going to have to say, you know what, I reject that because I know what this says. Or they say, oh, oh, so it doesn't say this. You see how it works? They've taken away the Word of God. Isaiah 28, verse 11. God Himself said, For with stammering lips and another tongue will He speak to this people. And, and, and all over the place, in churches everywhere, the official line of the churches is, Well, I believe in the Bible in the original languages. But God said that He was going to speak in other tongues. Go read 1 Corinthians 14 because when Paul quoted Isaiah 20 and 11, he said, for with men of other lips and other tongues will he speak to this people. God intends to speak to us in this language. Right here. And it's sort of like this Hebrew and this Greek here. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 9. Let me, let me tell you where it comes from. 
stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. Let me stop right here. Remember what Delilah caused to have Samson do. She caused him to sleep upon her knees. And right here, the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes and the prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Verse 11, and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that has learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. In verse 13, the Bible says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me. That's, you know what that sounds like? That sounds like all the praise and worship services going on in every church. Yeah, you go in there, and yeah, they got good music. And I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay, The music, remember it's got to have a replacement. The music has become a replacement for the Word of God. And so he says, For as much as his people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the what? precept of men. Whereas, whereas, this Bible will tell you that number one, the words of the Lord are pure words. That it was the inspired word of God. That it's the preserved word of God. That it was translated in languages that you and I understand. Whereas, that's what this Bible says. These guys coming out of the big universities and the seminaries are saying, now, really, there's no way that you can know what this, but you can read it. But you can't really know what this book says. Only those who get into the original language. You know what that, you know what that came from? That came from the Vatican. The Vatican refused to let any, any priest in the church read the scriptures other than in Latin for years. You know why? Oh, it's not for the profane people to know what the Holy Scripture says. See? See where the doctrines come from? Are you going to believe men? Or are you going to believe God? Let me show you another way. Let me show you another way that they replace the Word of God. I have here a Bible that I bought for my wife back when I was ignorant. Okay? It's a New International Version, Life Application Bible. And I can see what it is right here. Okay? There's Bible written up here, or something that looks like Bible, CNIV. And then down here, it's got all these big notes on here and all these little commentaries. You see, that's that's something you hear. You, when you, you just listen to preachers preach nowadays. Okay? You listen to them preach. Those who want to even sound spiritual, they'll say, now, Dr. So-and-so said this, and, and uh, according to such and such, in his commentary on the, on the Book of Romans, it says this. And we have pastors who will spend all week long studying and reading commentaries, one commentary after another, trying to find out, you know, maybe this says, uh, maybe I can get a new angle on this. You see, it's all about the pastor trying to look better and smarter than his congregation. And he knows that most people in his congregation have not been to Bible college, they don't know how to read Greek, and they don't have 20 commentaries in their library. And so he, he may not be equal, he may be equal to them when it comes to just reading the Bible, but he's got them because he can throw commentary after commentary after commentary. And you know what? Commentaries were written by men. God, God actually wrote a commentary. You know what it's called? The Bible. The Bible is the commentary. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 actually tells you how to study and understand the Bible. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Now, the guys who publish stuff like this want you to believe that you're to compare the Scripture with their notes. The Scripture, with their commentary, they'll tell you what it really means. God said, no, that's man. You compare Scripture with Scripture. And I'll give you understanding. Even if the learned professors can't read it, those who say they know me but they don't, even if, even, even if they say they can tell you what it means, don't believe them. Don't believe them. Your doctrines and your ideas and your power as a Christian is not going to come from commentaries, 40 days of purpose, 
little candy store Christian books that are at the Christian bookstore, none of that stuff. They're going to come from the sincere milk and meat of the Word of God. And you, and because, because, because it's being taught in the seminaries and the Bible colleges and the people are saying, well, you see, you really can't, you really can't understand the Bible. You don't know the rules for interpreting Scripture. You don't know all these things. You don't have the degree. I'm a, I'm a doctor of divinity. I'm a master of theology. I know all of these things. See, it's all full of pride. You see, I just happen to believe that the Bible is written plainly. Let me, let me pull this up again here. This is my Greek New, uh, Novum Testamentum. Okay? And um, now I will tell you. This is not the Greek New Testament I used in, in Bible college, in Greek class. I used a cheater one. It's an interlinear Greek New Testament. See, it has Greek here, and it's got little English words written underneath it. I cheated. Okay? It's okay. I, didn't, I never used it. Okay? And so, uh, I quit using it. Uh, but you read this, and you know what? It, that doesn't look very plain to me. I can't even understand the, the script. Let me show you what I'm getting at. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2. The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Now, let me get back to uh, Joe Smith here. I never really believed that was his real name. Let me get back to Joe Smith here. Joe Smith said that the angel moron, I, um, showed him some plates. In fact, I think there's a picture of that somewhere in here. Showed him some copper, uh, some copper plates that were buried down in the ground. Think about that for a while. Uh, and he dug them up, and he found these copper plates, and they were written in this uh, reformed uh, hier Egyptian hieroglyphic thing that nobody has ever seen before. And he didn't know what they meant, had no idea what they even looked like. He put on these special glasses, and uh, he couldn't read them. Okay, until he put on the Urim and the Thummim and, and now he could translate it. But they weren't written plainly upon tables and that is exactly the opposite of what God told Habakkuk to do. He said, write it on table and make it plain so that he may that run that readeth it. He may understand what is written here. So the same thing that Joseph Smith did is the same thing that the Roman Catholic Church wants everybody to believe that you cannot understand the Bible. That's for the priest and the bishops and the Holy Pope. Uh, these guys coming out of Bible college saying, you can't read this, and I know it. I'm the only one that can. So if you really want to know what the real Word of God says, you have to get it from me. See, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. The devil came and took the Word away. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, look at this. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. You see, abolished. You see, Christ took away the veil. And so now what is written, if you'll read the little bit of the New Testament, a little bit of the Old Testament, you do that on a regular basis, I guarantee you, the veil is going to come off in your mind and you're going to understand things you've never understood before. Because it's written plainly. Now, let me tell you this story. First Kings. Remember, remember her. Remember Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of Harlot. She was Delilah. Cut the power of God off in Samson's life. Now he has no power. Okay? Then we have Jezebel. Okay? I've met her before. Okay? We have Jezebel. And uh, Ahab, the king, wants Naboth's vineyard. Don't you think about a vineyard? Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, the same, here it is, bringeth forth much fruit. It's about the power of God. It's about the power of salvation in a person's life. And the devil wants to take that away. Thus, Ahab wants Naboth's vineyard. Naboth received that vineyard as a free gift to him by his father. It was an inheritance. I have received this Bible as a free gift to me from the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not to sell it. I'm not to give it away. Notice what Ahab said. Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. And notice this now. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or... If it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. Now I want you to notice this, okay? Because Ahab wants to take away your vineyard. 
He wants to take away the Word of God out of your life. The power of God, the power of the sea. A vineyard is where the grapes are. The grapes contain the new wine. Did you know that the Spirit is the new wine? There, there we are back to the Spirit, the seven spirits of God and the power of God. Here we are right back to the Bible. And, Na- and, and Ahab wants to take that away from you and Jezebel, her, is going to facilitate that. She's the one that's in the Bible colleges. She's the one that's in all this. Uh, this great controversy, Ellen White. She is in all of this stuff right here. Replacements for the Word of God. You don't, you don't need this stuff. You need this right here is what you need. But she wants to take that away from you. She wants to cut that off from you. Notice that Ahab said, he said, uh, if you want, I'll give you money instead of you having the vineyard. I'll, I'll give you money for it. Remember, remember the thorns choking out the word. You remember that? The thorns come in, choke out the word. Okay, And the thorns are the deceitfulness of riches. So here's what happens. Okay, the Ahab says, "Now, now Naboth, I'm not just going to take your vineyard and you have nothing. I'm going to replace it with something. How about money? Do you want some money?" So we have the prosperity gospel. It's a replacement for the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not the real gospel. It's, it's, a, it's a religious idea that says if you do the right things, then you're a wealthy person. God will make you rich. And it's a sellout. You see, I would, rather, I would rather not have two pennies to rub together and still have the word of God than to give up the greatest riches that I have ever experienced and seen in my life and trade it in for money. I won't do it. But millions of people all over the world, not only in America, when I went to, uh, over the seas into Kenya, I saw the prosperity gospel in the poorest nation of the world. And preachers preaching it, saying, if you'll give all of your money to me, then God will give you a lot of money back. And these poor people, who in some cases didn't have food that night, gave everything they had. That's sick. The prosperity Gospels. Men like Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Rodney Howard Brown, um, Robert Tilton, all of these, uh, Mike Murdoch, uh, all of these other people, Joyce Myers, all of them, prosperity and wealth preachers. They said, see, they've taken the power of God and they've replaced it with their charismatic gifts and their signs and wonders. And they said, now, you'll become wealthy if you'll just do what we tell you to do. See, it's a replacement, isn't it? Okay. The other thing Ahab said was, um, I'll, I'll, give you, uh, I'll, I'll give you something better than what you have. Okay? I'll give you something better. Here's the new paradigm in the churches. See, the devil has come in now in churches all across this land. And I don't care what denomination they were in. The devil has the devil didn't say, oh no, they're, they're Baptists. I, I, I can't touch them. I, I, I would feel bad. No, he went into the Baptists. He went into the Nazarene. He went into the Pentecostal. He went into the, uh, he went into the Methodists. He went into the Foursquare. He went in every religious Christian denomination that there is. And he took the word out. He took it out. Took it out of the churches. Took it out of everything. And now, now the church doesn't have any power. Doesn't have any real power to stand against their enemies. But, you see, here's the, here's the thing. When Samson woke up, did you know that he didn't even realize that his power was gone? He thought he still had it. So the devil comes in with pseudo power. A replacement power. So what do we see it, how, how do we see it defined in these churches? Well, they talk about, the churches will advertise all over the place, their energetic music. Okay, You know what that, they'll use dynamic music. You know, the word dy, dynamic comes from the Greek word dunamos, which means power, which is where we get the word dynamite from. Okay, And so these churches will, will put themselves out as, come and listen to our band. Okay. And anybody who's ever been to a sporting event knows 
that when you go to a sporting event, they will play music over the loudspeakers to do one thing, and that is to get the crowd pumped up in favor of the home team. You go to sporting events like hockey games, they're not playing Ina Kleine Nacht music. Okay? They're not playing Vivaldi's Four Seasons. They're playing hard, heavy metal, driving, pounding, rock music. That's what they're doing. Why? They're trying to stir up and energize the, cr the crowd. But after the game's over, that's all gone. Same way with the church services. Get them into the. And I've had people. I've had people who've told me to my face, you know, you know, Pastor, we, we like your teaching, but we, we go over here because you know we, we like the music better. Boom, da, boom, da, boom. Energetic music. Okay, uh, the the drums and the guitars and the people swaying and closing their eyes and doing all this and people in the audience doing this like they were at a concert and all. Oh, that feels so good and all oh, they experience so many wonderful emotions but it is not the power of God that brings a transformation in their life it's it's just fleeting music but it's a replacement uh, Christian so-called Christian teen events like dare to share youth workers and so on d6 conference it's all about pounding the music and they say see we're, we're really alive we got things going because of the music it's a replacement, people. It's not real. I found this from, this is from Youth Specialties. One of their speakers wrote a comment called The Future of Youth Ministry. Notice, notice what he put on here. There she is. There's Jezebel. Okay, the spirit that is controlling all of this is into the youth ministries, into the big, don't take your kids to the youth rock concert. Don't do it. They have replaced the Word of God with their driving music. And then we have dynamic preaching. You hear, you hear churches talk about, come, come and hear our dynamic preaching, our powerful, life-changing, relevant preaching. And I want you to listen for this. Next time you go to church, I want you to listen for this. I've heard this, okay? In the course of the sermon, the pastor... We'll quote from Winston Churchill, Mahatma Gandhi, Henry David Thoreau, Abraham Lincoln, Barack Obama, Joel Osteen. One pastor that I know, I actually went to Bible college with him, preached an entire sermon, notes and everything, from Joel Osteen's book, Your Best Life Now. Okay? My question is, what was he doing all week? Instead of studying, he just he opened the book and said, hey, I like that. Here, type this up and give this out to the congregation. That's how I know he did it. Somebody brought it to me. Okay, Dynamic preaching. They're quoting everybody in the world. They sit down, they'll give a little topic and they'll say, Now, Winston Churchill said this. And they'll give some little... And you go, Oh, ah, wow, that sounds good. Did you know... That's men. That's men. They, men do not have the power of God in them. It only the scripture. And so, listen to the preachers preach. And you'll hear them. Uh, Ronald Reagan said this. Such as John Wayne said this. And they'll quote everybody in the world. I don't want to hear what they said. I come to church because I want to hear, Thus saith the Lord. But see, they call this dynamic preaching. Another replacement for the Word of God, for the written Word of God, the power of God, contemplative prayer. We actually have an entire video on this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today dealing with contemplative prayer. We have a video called the, This Mystery of Contemplative Prayer. You need to get it and understand what it is because it is being pushed in every denomination in this country. Pushed hard including the denomination that I came out of, the Free Will Baptist. It's being pushed in there by their national magazine, promoted, contemplative prayer. You really want to get in touch with God? Go into a meditative trance, repeat a mantra over and over and over again in silence, and all of a sudden you're going to hear a voice on the inside of you. I'm going to tell you, that's not the voice of God. That's, and you, you listen, if you want to hear from God, read the scriptures. Read the scriptures. Uh, but they say, well, it's just a way that I can get uh, in touch with God. There is only one who can get you in touch with God, and that is the mediator, Jesus Christ. But see, they want to hear from God without the Bible. 
signs and wonders. Signs and wonders has become a replacement for the power of God. You go into these churches, Todd Bentley and these others go into these churches and you'll hear them talk about all the supernatural things that are happening, all the power of God's in here and all the people are rolling on the floor and people are talking in tongues and people are, I mean, their eyes are rolled back and they're in trances all over the place and people are doing all of these manifestations in the church. I think this is from Todd Bentley's uh, own blog, Fresh Fire. Todd Bentley's one of the leaders of this thing. Here's what he said. What amazing time we had this week. We just completed our Fresh Fire USA School of the Supernatural Realms of Heaven. We kicked off the school with a meet and greet, which really blessed us as we got to know our partners and so on and so on. Then he says, ministering under an open heaven and levels of prophetic revelation. Todd and Jason Hooper brought a new level of revelation on the reality of the supernatural. Worship was over the top with Josh Baldwin, Aaron Kreider, and Amber Brooks. The supernatural mantle really fell over the entire school. No mention of, we preached out of Isaiah chapter 28. No mention of uh, a discourse on the book of Romans, because that's all boring, learning the Bible. It's all about experiences and quote-unquote supernatural power that comes on without the preaching of the Word. I even know a guy. I went to, I went to Bible college with his, with his little brother, and I knew him by reputation. And I went to a teen camp that he preached at. And out of five sermons that he preached to teenagers, he didn't quote scripture one time. Not once. You see, he had the egotistical, self-centered, arrogant idea that the power of God would fall upon these young people by his, by his voice and his words and his mannerisms alone. That's what he thought. There was no power of God that week because there was no word given. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 31. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? Jeremiah 29 9. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. God, God didn't send them. They prophesy all this stuff, but they didn't do it. Dreams and visions. People that are having dreams and visions everywhere. False prophecies. It's a replacement for the Word of God. Stan Johnson in the Prophecy Club is full of dreams and visions. He put a guy named Demetri Dudeman out there on the road. Made videos about him. Demetri Dudeman goes around telling everybody, oh, God said this and God said that and oh, God did this and all. God showed me this and none of it ever happened. It's a replacement for the Word of God. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 32. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. I dealt with uh, this guy a few uh, a couple years ago, a guy by the name of Dr. Mark Verkler. He was on Sid Ross' uh, The Supernatural Show. And he was talking about hearing God's voice. He was on there talking about how you go into a trance, go into this contemplative prayer thing, and start writing down what you hear God say. That's a replacement for the real Word of God, and people are buying into it. Sounds like what Neil Donald Walsh wrote. Neil Donald Walsh was a New Ager who wrote a book called Conversations with God. He said that he heard from God personally. And here's what God told him. He said, words are really the least effective communicator. They're most open to misinterpretation, most often misunderstood. They are not truth. They are not the real thing. Words can only symbolize what you know and can often confuse what you know. Concerning books, including the Bible, here's what Neil Donald Walsh said that God told him. They are not authoritative sources. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? This guy is that God told him that the Bible is not an authority. Satan comes in and replaces the word. The new ecstaticism, the, the, the laughing revivals, the new ecstatics. Uh, John Crowder who tokes in the Holy Ghost 
and acts drunk. These are all. Re- this is what happens when the Bible is taken out of the way. You have this new Christian mysticism moving in. You have movies such as The Passion of the Christ. You say, oh, that was about Jesus. It was based upon the Gospel of Mark. No, it wasn't. You know what it was really based upon? It was based upon the ecstatic visions of a Roman Catholic nun by the name of Mary Catherine Emmerich who visualized the entire last week of Christ and wrote it down and that's what this movie was based upon. It is a false gospel. When you replace the word of God out of a church, you'll have you'll hear sermons on sex just about every Sunday. You'll have manifestations of angels. You have people talking about how gold dust is floating down from the ceiling and there'll be people with angel feathers showing all angels came and visited us. You see, this is exactly what they wanted to happen. These false spirits who manifest all these false gospels and false visions and false everything else, they cannot come in as long as this stands in the way. So we've got to get this out of the way. Now they come in. And now they're here. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You see, there are lying angels. There, do I believe that these angels manifested themselves? Do I believe that Joseph Smith saw an angel? I believe that he did. The angel Moroni. But there are lying spirits and lying angels. Paul said that we an angel. Bring any other gospel. Let it be cursed. There are cursed angels. Okay? There is a messenger of Satan. An angel of Satan. That God allowed to buffet Paul on a daily basis to keep him from being proud. Just because they're spirits and spiritual things, that doesn't mean they're from God. Especially when you remove the written Word of God. When this is out of the way, then what will happen is, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. When, when, when this Bible, the pure, inerrant, incorruptible Word of God, is taken away, choked out, or replaced, and there will be a replacement. All of these, the music, the preaching, the manifestations, the experiences, everything, those are all replacements for the real power of God in your life. And when you become convinced by anybody... That, well, this really isn't the Word of God. The original Hebrew and the original Greek is. When you become convinced by anybody that this Bible is not the real Word of God, you've, taken, you've had taken away the power of God in your life, and these things are what will follow. We've seen it happen in churches. I've seen it happen to preacher friends of mine. I've seen it happen to my denomination. And you have too. And Satan will be transformed. He'll get what he wants. Because right now, this is keeping him from it. And he wants it out of the way. God is looking for some people who will stand. And they'll say, not in my lifetime. Not on my watch. Be a good watchman. Be a good watchman. You stand when all others fall. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. We'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.